Hello and welcome back to our series, Objects of Crisis, in which we look into health, climate, political, social crisis of the past and of other parts of the world in this moment of a pandemic to understand how other people in other circumstances have lived up to um, challenges, how they've come on top of it, prevailed and sometimes faltered. Today, I have the great pleasure of welcoming my distinguished colleague, Listen Bolton, who is the keeper, that is the head of the Department of Africa, Oceania and the Americas. It's wonderful to have you listened and I'm very curious to learn which object you have chosen for this series. Thank you, Hartvig, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I thought about this for a long time and I, uh, I nearly did uh, choose an object related to a major volcanic eruption. And then I thought uh, every crisis is experienced personally. And when you think about a crisis, there's all things going on in the world, but for many people, it's, it has an immediate and personal effect. And I thought that many people who've been in lockdown, or perhaps even still are in lockdown, have experienced loneliness and feeling cut off. And that reminded me of uh, a story that I was told when I was doing my doctoral fieldwork in a country in the South Pacific called Vanuatu, uh, which was a story about these issues and which relates to a particular kind of object. So I looked in our collection to see if we had one such object because they're very rarely collected. And I found that we had one quite badly photographed, I'd have to say, because it's been photographed uh, only with its underneath showing and folded. But I thought nevertheless, I would tell the story. And friends of mine have, have one in their own private collection. So they very kindly sent me a photograph. So uh, I thought I might begin with a little introduction about where I'm talking about because people may not know. That would be most welcome. So I'm talking about a country in the southwestern Pacific called Vanuatu. It used to be known uh, by colonial, in the colonial era as the New Hebrides or Nouvelle Hebride. It was jointly uh, administered, actually never a colony, by Britain and France. And, uh, and then in 1980 it became the Republic of Vanuatu. It's an uh, archipelago of more than 80 islands, which lies in the southwestern Pacific, about a thousand kilometres east of Australia. In the north of this country is an island called Ambai. And I had the really amazing privilege in my life to spend a year living on Ambai in 91-92. So the, the object you're talking about is an object you encountered in, in that first moment of field work that you did? It's a kind of object that I encountered, not the object. It's a textile uh, made of plaited pandanus. So plaited because each thread is individually passed over or under the next thread. And it's made of uh, fine ribbons of uh, dried pandanus. Pandanus, sometimes known as cabbage tree palm in this country, has many different varieties. And the varieties that, uh, that are in Vanuatu produce these uh, beautiful, when, when properly prepared and processed, produce uh, beautiful long thin ribbons which are then plaited together and on Ambai they make quite a number of different plaited pandanus leaf textiles which to an Ambayan are very easy to tell apart but mm. uh, like we could tell a scarf from a tea towel we don't you know they're both squares of cloth roughly roughly the yeah, same size yeah. but we don't have any doubt which is which and often the way you tell them apart is by the side fringes and uh, also only certain designs appear on the different types. So if it's got this kind of design on, that's also a way of telling. And what does the design tell you? Um, does it tell you who made it or does it refer to, what does it refer to? That's the sort of question that a museum based anthropologist is very likely to ask. <laughs> and people say, it's the sun, you know. <laughs> Or it's pig's toes, which is one of the sub-designs. For most of the textiles, the design doesn't matter. There are some special uh, restricted textiles where the design matters a lot. But for this kind of textile, which is known as a kwanvuvulu, there isn't any um, yeah. significance. You, you said at the beginning that um, 
this is a story about an object that became meaningful for you in a particular situation. Well, um, when I was first living in the hamlet where I lived, um, the, uh, I was working with someone from the cultural centre and then I can't, to be honest, my field notes are locked in the British Museum at the moment and I can't get in there to read them and remind myself of this story. Yeah. So yeah. there may be a little rose coloured memory applying here. But um, anyway, something happened early on in my time living in this village, which made me a bit miserable and not to say teary. And the, the women in the village uh, or in this cluster of hamlets would be a better way of putting it. They, they kind of saw that I was feeling sad. And so they came and sat every night in the house with me and told me the fables and stories and histories that they tell in the house at night, traditionally. And there was a, a woman, one of the senior women in, the, in that cluster of hamlets was a lovely, lovely person called Madeline. She told this particular story about a young man who uh, was out of his place. So what I have to explain now is that in the past, people lived very much on their own land in their own district, and they were frightened, really, to go far afield. And that was still so much the case that if I, when I went to the north of the island and sometimes took someone from where I was with me, they might never have been to the, even 10 kilometres away on the north side of the island. So people, people were uh, afraid of sorcery, they were afraid of warfare and killing. And so you could go quite easily far from home. That's the first point. The second point is that in those societies, you are related to everybody. There's nobody that you aren't related to because the kinship structure constantly ramifies. So when I, joined, when I moved there, people, someone adopted me and then I became part of a family and then everybody knew what they were in relation to me by analogy. So if I was his daughter, then I was her father's sister's son, the father's sister's daughter or something like that. They, they everyone knew. So, but this story is about a young man who was out of his place and he came to a village and it was night. And he said to somebody, can, uh, I, I, I need something to sleep in. It gets cold at night there. And um, he said, well, I've got, I've got 10 kwafavulu and I lie on five and I cover myself up with five so I can't give you one. And so he went to someone else and he said, I've got nine kwafavulu. I have... I sleep on five, I cover myself up with five, four, so I have none to give you. Yeah. And so it went down through the numbers till one. And that man said, I have one, one fufulu, I lie on half and I cover myself up with half, which is in fact how people often sleep. The one fufulu has fringes all along the length of it. And if you put one on top of each other, the fringes immediately tangle and they hold themselves in place. So then when you lie in it, you don't lose your bedding in the night. It, it stays. Yeah, yeah. Sort of stays. So the young man was quite despairing and he went away out of the, out of the village, out of the inhabited space into what is known in, in uh, Vishma as the bush, dark bush, or we might call it jungle, but it's halfway between the two really. And, and he covered himself up in ban dry banana leaves and he died of exposure. And Madeline finished that story, which she told all the way through the numbers, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. And then she said, I, I always felt so sorry for that young man. It's a story about not being in relationship. It's a story about being alone, not being connected, being isolated, being uncared for. And that's why I thought about it in relation to our current situation, the pandemic, the lockdown, because there are people who are feeling very isolated and alone and no longer connected, which is not a, which is not a um, global crisis. It's just a personal trouble. Anyway, now listening to you, um, they, they, they gave you their stories as blankets to, to cover you, to give you some kind of protection. Um, you, yes, I've, I've never pushed it quite that far, but you, you, you could, in a kind of, in a kind of uh, retelling, although anthropologists aren't supposed to do that. It is strengthening the notion and making you understand that you are 
community. You are in the community. The interesting thing is that in uh, our society, we think of the individual. We think of ourselves as a sort of bounded individual. We don't think of ourselves. We think of ourselves having relationships, but it's sort of an individual. In, in, in Ambi, or certainly in Ambi 30 years ago, people didn't really think of themselves as an individual. <clears throat> they thought of themselves more like a node in a network. They thought of themselves as constituted by their relationships and as being who they are because of their relationships. And they were so secure in those relationships that people would change their name through life yeah. to mark the different stages of their life. You can only change your name if everybody still knows who you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So to be without relationships in that society is just devastating. And so this young man who, who, who no one would give uh, Kwantavulu to to sleep under was, was really cut off. So one could say he died, of, I mean, it's a fable, so let's not get over analytical, but you could say that he died of um, exposure or you could say that he died of sorrow and alienation and separation. What has grown out of that um, um, intimate relation that you've had living with that community? Are you still linked with them do you go back do they do they come and see you at the british museum um yes and yes and yes and i'm supposed to be there now so i'm i'm supposed to be on ambi roughly around now which is extremely frustrating but jean tarisese my very dear friend and sister has uh come here a couple of times when she comes over to see you here in the past she would study textiles and other objects in, in the collection? She came and she went through all the textiles in the collection. In fact, the textile that I'm showing you was misattributed to another island. And she was like, what's this? This is Amber. <laughs> this, is, this is a guanpul, this is Amber. Yeah. So um, having her say that was lovely. It's also important for the records. It's also important that the, the object is on, on collection online. It's extremely important. It's crucial. And that's why, I mean, we, for that project, we did that a lot. We brought people from different parts of the Western Pacific to look at our collections with us and to, to give us advice. And we also took photographs of the, so I took photographs of our collections, obviously, um, yeah. uh, back to Ambi as well. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but it, uh, it's one thing to take photographs, um, but it's another thing to have have the for good, great good fortune to be able to bring people here. The, the so, museum is, is a convening place for this, you know, for this renewal, for this constant work. I feel very strongly that in um, AOA, we are always building relationships, sharing, having the privilege of, of, of knowing people and um, having the privilege when they're willing to of learning what they know about our collections and then also sharing our collections. Mm. It's a, it's um, it's a constant work, um, but it's a it's it's a good work. And I think it's 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 really wonderful that you chose an object that that relates so directly to you. I mm. think that's that's really powerful. Thank you for watching. We very much look forward to welcoming you back at the British Museum very soon.